the center of worship. The earth has its kings, but God is the ruler of all. Praise God above all, the giver of life. The mountains may tremble, the oceans may roar, but God's presence is more powerful than the earth itself. Come into God's presence, for God is among us now. O oh God, show us your glory. We seek your ways. Come to the rock, the God of life, for God is present now. Let us pray our prayer of confession in unison. God of mercy, we placed our trust in tangible things, things we can see and touch and question whether you are really there. Forgive us, Holy One. When we fail to recognize that you are always nearby, patiently waiting for us to recognize your presence and your glory. Help us when we lose our way, and forgive us when we forget to whom we truly belong. Lover of justice, open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear you, open our hearts to love you, and open our hands to serve you. Amen. When we cry to God, look for favor in God's sight. God answers, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. In the power of the Spirit and in the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. We will rest in God's mercy.
Let us hear from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verse 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, What image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Hello, Dr. Lee Barrett. Hello. So this is Lee Barrett from Lancaster Theological Seminary. And how long have you been there, Lee? Uh, 26 years. 26 years. And I'm Jonette Gay, the pastor of Otterbein United Methodist. And I wanted to hear a word from you about Henry Nouwen's theology of stewardship. It fascinates me because he seems to be so otherworldly, and I don't think of him as being a pragmatist. So could you give us a word about Henry Nouwen and money, or Henry Nouwen and stewardship? Yes, and, and, and you're right. It was very shocking that uh, Henry Nouwen, who was a major practitioner and theoretician of spirituality uh, from the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, uh, Roman Catholic priest, popular with both Protestants and Catholics, uh, who was known for his otherworldliness and his, his holiness. He, I was a student of his. He insisted on living in the dorms with his students because he thought that anybody engaged in any kind of ministry should share the life of the people to whom he was ministering. So he shared our communal bathroom, and on Saturday mornings, after a hard night of partying Friday night, we'd get up, go to the bathroom, and there would be Henry brushing his teeth, and all the rest of us would just leave and say, we can't take this much sanctity this early in the morning with, before <laughs> we've had coffee, because he was just radiating goodness. He probably could not fill out his income tax reforms because he was so oblivious to everything economic. <laughs> He made a lot of money uh, on his books and lectures on spirituality, but he gave it all away, and he never knew what was in his bank account. So it was an anomaly that he would uh, write uh, a book and, and, and teach and give lectures on the spirituality of stewardship. And he was troubled by the fact that that was one of the practices of the church raising money for the church that most folks seem to be very shy uh, about and even frightened of. And he, he always wondered why that was, why, spirit, why stewardship and asking people for money if you're on the soliciting side or giving money if you're on the donor side, why that was uh, such a forbidden topic and uh, uh, was so troubling for people. So his diagnosis was that people shy away from either, either the asking or the giving in a stewardship campaign because they're afraid. Um, and his, his, the next step in his reflection was, well, what is it that people are afraid of uh, in, in regard to stewardship? And his answer was, they're afraid of admitting their vulnerability on both sides. If you're on the asking side, if you're, you're a part of a stewardship campaign and you're one of the solicitors, uh, you're afraid that you'll be rebuffed, 
that people will look at you and say, oh, this is just like a Jehovah's Witness um, who's trying to get their hands in my pocket and they are being nice to me just because they feel obligated to do so in order to put me off guard and get money from me. So people are afraid that that's what the other is thinking. Uh, that, and, and that if you show up uh, with a, with asking for a, a, a pledge to the congregation that people won't like you, that they'll be suspicious of you, and even worse, that if they don't pledge enough, that that uh, that means that they don't value you or your congregation's mission and vision. So people are afraid of being devalued, uh, be, being regarded with suspicion and animosity, and therefore they're reluctant to ask. Maybe afraid of rejection? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the rejection is, if I'm rejected, that must mean there's something wrong with me, I have no value, or there's something wrong with my congregation or my congregation's mission, uh, and in the eyes of others, it's worthless. So they're, they're afraid of rejection. That's a good way to put it. Uh, on, the, on the donor's side, um, what's, again, the source of the fear is the fear that you will perceive as not giving enough and that would suggest that maybe you don't have adequate resources uh, to, to give more. Maybe you're not doing well financially. Um, maybe you're too selfish. So, and, and again, and then in, in the eyes of the, uh, uh, of the world, that would be like saying, I'm not financially secure enough to give or I'm not charitable enough to give. There's something wrong with me. And again, you're afraid of criticism. So in, in both cases, uh, the problem is fear of being devalued by the other, by the other person on both sides, whether it's the asker or the giver. And if that's the case, if there's any truth in what now and uh, uh, thought about that, uh, the solution is simple and it's a bit harsh. It's simply, Get over it. Get over reliance upon the approval and affirmation uh, of the other person or, 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 or the, the other institution, whatever it is. Um, now that's hard to do. And now in being a Christian knew that you can't just get up in the morning and say, okay, I'm too dependent upon others' opinions of me. I'm too afraid of rejection. I'm too afraid of suspicion. I'm too afraid of hostility. Uh, and therefore, I think I'll just stop. And from now on, I'm going to grit my teeth, uh, exercise my willpower, and I'll be uh, a more self-reliant, self-content person, not needing the approval of others. Well, now I knew you, you can't do that. He was a theologian. He was a spiritual guide. He was a, uh, a, a professor of, of uh, re the psychology of religion. So for, for all those reasons, he knew that that's not possible. So how do you get over yourself? How do you get over feeling like you need the approval of others? Well, now in concluded that the answer in Christianity is simply an awareness of God's grace. That if we knew and felt that God approves of us, that God values us, that God confers worth on us, that God loves us, and that that is unconditional and eternal, then we wouldn't so desperately need other people's opinions, uh, other people's valuation, uh, we'd, so that we could become what he called jolly beggars. We could not uh, go, go up to another congregant if we were on the stewardship uh, team and say to ourselves, I really don't need this person to like me. I don't need this person to value me because I know God already does. And that's all I really need. The only approval I need is God's. The only love I need is God's, really. Um, and therefore, whether this person accepts me or rejects me, whether they respond to my ask or don't, doesn't really matter uh, in, the, in the long run in regard to my relationship with God because I already have all the love I need. And therefore, you can ask without fear. 
without fear of rejection. Uh, and now in thought that that sense of God's love, of being loved by God, could be nurtured by prayer, by participating in the worship of the church, by contemplation, that we all have access to God's love. And if we only avail ourselves of that, then we wouldn't fear rejection. We wouldn't fear asking somebody to pledge to the church and being rebuffed. Uh, and we wouldn't fear uh, looking like we don't have enough money because our pledge was so small. Uh, we, we, we don't even fear uh, looking like we're uncharitable uh, because we know God loves us. So that was Nouwen's uh, solution to almost every human problem. Just get in touch with the fact that God loves you and that's not contingent upon what other people think of you. And for him, that was very liberating and that that should be the basis of all uh, stewardship. Um, and he thought when that happens, when somebody knows that God loves them, then you can ask without fear of rejection and you can give without fear of criticism. And that that itself becomes a bond of community. Say, well, we're, we're, we're both beggars in need of God's love. We know that. So let's band together and pool our resources and cooperate with one another to spread this word that God loves humanity, to spread the gospel uh, throughout the congregation and throughout the world. So, so that in a nutshell was Nouwen's stewardship uh, theology. That is wonderful. So it is a spiritual issue. It is a spiritual problem. It's not the, just the pragmatism of right. it. What a wonderful, thank you for this message that um, just seems obvious, but it is not, and it's so essential. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate your time. Same question. We are all familiar with that famous Benjamin Franklin quote, in this world, two things are certain, death and taxes. Last week, we took a look at death, or we honored those we love who have died at All Saints Sunday service. And this week, we're taking a look at taxes for this is a season of elections, and we're paying attention to our nation and how our faith fits in with all of that. And so two groups come together to ask Jesus a question. They don't want to know the answer. They just want to trap him. That's what it says. They want him to be caught up in his own words and either get in trouble with the government, the Roman Empire, or to get in trouble with the religious leaders and speak against God himself. So they come and they give him a compliment, Jesus. We know you're a man of integrity and you don't show favoritism to anyone. So we know that you will give us an answer. So is it right? Is it lawful to give our taxes to the emperor, to Caesar? And Jesus knows that they're trying to test him. And he says, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Well, where'd that come from? You know, you can tell a narcissist, and we've had many examples of it. You can tell a narcissist who is accusing you of something, which is really simply a confession of what they're doing. That's what a narcissist does. Oh, you hypocrite, show me a coin. So they show him a coin. Now, whose image is on this? Caesar's. So give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I look at our coins. We have George Washington on the quarter. We have Thomas Jefferson on the nickel. We have FDR on the dime. And, of course, Lincoln on the penny. So do we give all of our money to the government? It's not, we also have in God we trust, so maybe we give all of it to the pastor, I mean the church. No, I think there is something so important, and I don't always want to make a direct connection to the words in the Bible then and to say what it means today, but I know that we too pay taxes, and we too sometimes resent it, and 
although our system is not as oppressive as it was in Rome, yet we pay taxes and we benefit from those taxes. We have roads, we have infrastructure, we have teachers, we have police, we have mental health workers. Many things are benefited for the common good, and therefore we don't want to try to get out of it and try to find ways to keep from paying our part. That's not smart that's not uh, caring, that is just a way of benefiting from something without paying our fair share. So give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And then he doesn't stop there, though. He says, give to God what is God's. Give to God what is God's. So maybe the rest is God's. Like we will support the church with our prayers, our prayer without ceasing. That's where the head covering from Mennonites come from because they're always in prayer or the, the desire is that that's the symbolism. Pray without ceasing and not simply an external uh, way of showing it, but to do it, to pray, not um, I'm going to have my eyes closed and my hands like this, it's interesting that the emoji in the on the internet is um, thanks is the hands together. It's not it doesn't say prayer. It says thanks, which I think that that's pretty significant. That it's a time of gratitude to give thanks for what God gives us. We give reluctantly to our country with our coins, but we also are to and pray in thanksgiving and pray for the things we cannot control and to remember that God is sovereign. So we pray, we offer God our prayers, our presence. We show up. We do not forsake assembling the way some have in the book of Hebrews. It says that um, that's where the first I am spiritual but not religious were. No, nothing new there, nothing new under the sun. With our prayers, our presence, our gifts, give to God what is God, and our service. Our gifts and our service. Our gifts, our time. Give to God what is God's. Give the rest to God. I hope we don't forget that part. For we know we pay our taxes whether we want to or not, but we also benefit from them. So as much as I may say, well, this is a lot of taxes, but I do want teachers. I do want mental health workers. I do want police. I do want the people in the world who can help um, create the common good. But I don't want to neglect the second part of that and give to God what is God's. Give to God what is God's. For it's pretty important that we think about the image. It was They were hypocrites because they weren't supposed to have a coin. They weren't supposed to have a coin that had the image of Caesar. They, they were supposed to have coins that had did not have the image, uh, an image of a person, because there are to be no other gods but God. There are to be no other graven images. So Caesar was not to be their God. And they were caught red-handed that you're benefiting from this. You have something that is not lawful in our system and you benefit from it. So why are you testing me? It's not an either or. You give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You give to your country what is your country's. You give to God what is God's. It's a separate thing. And I love what Alfred Lloyd Tennyson said in his one of his poems. 
He said, our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O Lord, art more than they. Our little systems have their day. They have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee. But thou, O Lord, art more than thee. We can trust and show loyalty to our God, who is sovereign over all nations, so that we can be a healing voice to the world. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, we lift up our country and its people and give thanks for them and for all people. We pray you hear your people. We pray that everywhere on earth the church may speak out without fear for peace and the rights and dignity of the human person. We pray you hear your people. We pray that justice and love and responsible freedom may be the basis of the social order in the world and in our country, that all may live in peace and security. We pray that all humanity may share equitably in the world's material and spiritual goods and that the state and civic organizations may help and protect the weak and the victims of calamities. We pray you hear your people. Almighty God, we pray that all citizens may have a strong sense of civic responsibility and actively participate toward the common welfare. Awaken us, O oh God, that the church in our country may bear witness to God's kingdom, that our country may play a role of honor in the family of nations and cooperate for world peace and unity. Oh God, you love people and people are your concern. Make us share in your care through your son who became one of us. For Caesar, do you create the stars? Do you hurl them into the reaches of the universe? Did you issue rules that keep the planets in place? Can you make blood course through our veins or craft an offer or a moonflower? Then keep your coins. They can't buy what we need. God, it is your face we see in our world, our very lives, our breath and love. We owe every single thing to you. Claim it all. Claim us. Please take us as your own. O oh, loving God, we thank you for protecting us in our daily lives by providing an ordered and peaceful existence. Help us to obey and respect the governing authorities. And above all, lead us to honor and obey you, O oh Lord, and to serve you with all that you've given us. We pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us this prayer we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go now as those who have found favor in the sight of God. Be imitators of Jesus Christ and an example to all the life of faith. To the world in which you live, give your love and service. And to God, give all that you are and all that you shall be. And the glory of God's goodness be revealed to you. May the grace and peace of Jesus Christ take root in you, and may the inspiration of the Holy Spirit fill you with joy. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord.